When I think of RPGs with retro-futuristic settings, zany humor, and branching dialogue options, I think of Fallout. And then I think of the Outer Worlds. So here's 107 facts about Obsidian's brand new IP. It's got plenty that's new, but also lots that feel familiar to longtime Fallout fans. Number 1. Let's kick things off with the basics. Obsidian revealed the Outer Worlds during the Game Awards in 2018 after teasing it on their website the week before. Number 2. It's a first-person RPG full of choices. Your character could charm the space pants off everyone with their silver tongue, or they can use their big shooty gun to get things done. There's all sorts of ways you can solve your problems in the Outer Worlds, and it all depends on how you build your character. Number 3. This isn't the first time Obsidian has tackled first-person RPGs with guns. Previously, the developer made Fallout New Vegas, a spin-off of the franchise based on Bethesda's reimagining of the Fallout universe. The Outer Worlds might just be the New Vegas 2 that never was. Number 4. Fans of the old-school Fallout games also have a reason to be excited for Obsidian's newest title. Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky, the co-creators of Fallout, are spearheading the Outer Worlds, so you can expect some wacky role-playing shenanigans. Number 5. They never saw themselves returning to Fallout, but Tim Kaine has said that he's had a grand idea for a game since Fallout 1. In 2017, he said he wouldn't want to make it because it wouldn't live up to whatever's in his brain. Number 6. However, many bits of the Outer Worlds came from design notebooks that Kane had around the same time he worked on Fallout 1 over 20 years ago. So maybe those ideas are finally coming to life in 2019? We can't say for sure, but we do know that the Outer Worlds has been an internal idea for longer than some of us have been alive. Number 7. This is a true passion project for Kane and Boyarsky. They get along well, obviously, and they both cover each other's weaknesses. It's like a match made in heaven, if that heaven were in a dystopian future. Number 8. The Outer Worlds takes place in a futuristic sci-fi future, as you journey through the faraway off-world colony of Halcyon. Don't worry, everything is peaceful in Halcyon, and everyone is guaranteed a lifetime of happiness. Corruption? Corporate greed? Nah, you won't find any of that here. Number 9. Just kidding, that's pretty much all you'll find here. The game takes influence from the 1985 dystopian film Brazil which depicts a capitalist, almost Orwellian nightmare. But don't worry, there's still some flashes of Futurama-style humor to lighten things up. Obsidian, you can shut up and take my money already. Number 10. Back on Earth, things took a different turn around the early 20th century. Capitalism ran amok, and the big monopolies run by robber barons were never broken up. Eventually, the world went down an alternate timeline, one dominated by unchecked corporate greed. Number 11. These mega corporations controlled the world, but the world wasn't enough. Their desire for more fueled humanity's space travel efforts, and they started buying up the various habitable planets and solar systems in the galaxy. Number 12. Halcyon is one of the more contested solar systems that they latched onto, and 10 mega corporations share it. They want to control everything in people's lives. Number 13. Halcyon isn't the only colonized system in this galaxy. Obsidian documented various other ones, some of which are owned by just one company or governing body. There's even a super wealthy guy who bought a colony just for himself and no one's seen it for a century. These things might not show up in the full game itself, but the developers have clearly fleshed out this brand new universe. Number 14. Narrative designer Dan McPhee says these mega corporations reflect a bit of the real world itself. The Outer Worlds has an obvious message behind its wacky narrative, but it's all done through absurd parodies. Number 15. Take Anti-Cleos as an example. The corporation serves food that's 99% guaranteed to have been grown in a lab, including tumors that grew off a pig. Sounds tasty, right? Number 16. As gross as that sound, it's not as nauseating as the game's portrayal of awful working conditions. Employees in Halcyon often don't get much time off, which sounds eerily like the crunch that happens at many major game studios. Senior designer Brian Haynes told Vice that working conditions aren't like that at Obsidian, but it's good that the crunch issue is getting more attention. Number 17. Aside from the Futurama references, the team looked to other sci-fi staples for some inspiration. Many of the developers are fans of classics like Star Trek, and the camaraderie among your crew members might evoke memories of fire fly. Number 18. Your character was aboard the Hope, one of two huge ships sent out to colonize Halcyon. See, ships can travel beyond the speed of light through what's called skip space. Unfortunately, things don't go as planned with the Hope, and it jumps out of skip space a bit too early. Number 19. So, for 70 years, your character has been cryogenically frozen, Futurama style, while drifting through space, Planet of the Apes style. Normally, being frozen for that long is a death sentence, but luckily, a very smart scientist safely wakes you from your cold slumber. Number 20. That scientist's name is Phineas Wells, and he opposes the board, a conglomeration of the corporations that control Halcyon. You'll have to decide between siding with Wells or the board, 
ultimately influencing where the story goes. Number 21. Or you could just flip them both the bird and go your own way. You could be a double-crossing double agent or just a simple selfish wanderer who takes everything for themselves. The outer worlds are your oysters. Number 22. That being said, you'll still find tons of side quests and little stories during your time in Halcyon. The decisions you make during these may or may not impact the larger story but they'll still play a role in telling the tale of your character. Number 23. Similar to New Vegas, expect a slideshow showcasing just how good, or let's be honest bad, of a person your character was to different factions. Number 24. And your character can be really bad. We're talking full-on supervillain levels of bad here. Senior narrative designer Megan Starks claims that certain choices can lead to you being the antagonist of the Outer Worlds. While she didn't exactly say how that would pan out, because, you know, spoilers, she did imply that the story would drastically change. Number 25. Obsidian isn't just worried about these big choices, though. They want you to care about the little choices, too. For example, if you walk into a new settlement with your guns out, people will be wary of you. If you walk around without clothes on, NPCs will absolutely notice and comment on it. Number 26. Every little and big choice you make affects the way others in the world see you. In fact, if you make too many unpopular decisions, certain NPCs will refuse to work with you and won't give you quests anymore. Number 27. Companions may even leave your company in the middle of a mission, which means you'll have one less bodyguard out there in Halcyon. Number 28. These characters react to your actions in organic, human ways, but don't expect to shack up with any of them. Obsidian felt implementing worthwhile roles romance mechanics wasn't worth their time. Number 29. In the Outer Worlds, the most important character is you. In Fallout, you've gone by everything from the Vault Dweller to the Lone Wanderer, but in this world, you're simply known as the Stranger. Number 30. You can design your character and choose their gender, but the biggest decision you'll have to make is how you balance out the three core sets of attributes. You've got body, mind, and personality. Number 31 has two subsets, so there's six attributes in total. Strength and dexterity make up your body, while intelligence and perception are for your mind. Personality comes down to charm and temperament, just like in real life. Number 32. If you invest a lot in a specific attribute, you'll get bonuses when you try to accomplish certain actions. For example, if you're really charming, you'll be more likely to persuade someone to do your bidding. It's the perfect way to play for those who want to avoid too much bloodshed. Number 33. However, the opposite is just as true. You can rank below average in any of your attributes, making certain actions harder to pull off. This can sometimes lead to hilarious interactions, though. If your character has below average intelligence, they might get excited about an upcoming tea party when an NPC says something isn't their cup of tea. Number 34. Exhibit A. Your ship. You know, that thing you need to rely on to survive the harshness of space travel. Yeah, it's called, uh, the unreliable. Number 35. The unreliable also has a sentient AI named Ada, or the autonomous digital astrogator. She, or it, grows as you grow, adjusting to your personality. But no matter what, she won't judge you or your horrible life choices. Your ship is the unreliable, but you can rely on Ada. Number 36. Exhibit B. You can be increasingly passive-aggressive in conversations, ultimately ending an interaction with an option that reads, Exude Wordless Fury. Look, we've all been there. The outer world just lets you live out that fantasy for a minute. Number 37. To bring it back to the nitty gritty, your six attributes inform your skills and perks. Yeah, Obsidian takes his RPG mechanics seriously here, and there are many complex layered systems in place that determine all sorts of things about your character. Number 38. You have seven overarching skills to worry about. Melee, Range, Defense, Dialogue, Stealth, Tech, and Leadership. Each of them has some sub-skills nestled under them, but to put it simply, you can basically play any kind of character you want. Number 39. When you level up, you earn points that you can put into those seven skills, and it trickles down to the sub-skills too. For every point you pump into Melee, for example, you increase both of the sub-skills under it, so it's a little less complicated than it sounds. Number 40. Some sub-skills are pretty self-explanatory. There's different categories of weapon skills, like two-handed Melee and long weapons, Sneak makes you sneakier, you know the deal. But the leadership subskills, inspiration and determination, don't sound as clear cut. Number 41. Both skills make your companions stronger. To keep it simple, inspiration makes your companions more deadly, while determination makes them tougher to kill. So, if you want to sit on the sidelines and have your posse fight your battles, these are the subskills for you. Number 42. Your perks are another story. You pick one every time you level up, and these provide you some flat bonuses, like extra health or faster sprinting speed. You'll find a whopping 42 perks to choose from across three tiers, with the later ones providing better bonuses. Number 43. Don't sweat the perks too much, though. If you ever make a mistake or feel like a certain perk isn't helping you out, you can always respect to change things up. Number 44. The level cap is set at 30, so you can't be a walking demigod and have all the perks. Number 45. Leveling up isn't the only way to get perks, though. As you play the game, your character can develop flaws. 
If you take a nasty hit to the head, you could get permanently concussed and lose some intelligence. However, to balance things out, you'll earn a perk point. Number 46. On normal difficulty, you can only have three flaws. In hard mode, you'll get four flaws. On the hardest mode, you can have a total of five flaws. Good news though, you don't have to accept a flaw if you don't want it. Number 47, unless you play the Outer Worlds on the hardest difficulty, Supernova. On top of being difficult in general, this mode forces you to take every flaw you develop. Number 48, additionally, Supernova mode turns the Outer Worlds into a survival game, kind of like the survival mode from New Vegas. You'll have to manage your basic needs and find safe places to sleep. If you're looking for a hardcore experience, Obsidian has you covered. Number 49, however, you don't have to go crazy if that's not your cup of tea. You could always play on story difficulty, which takes most of the challenge out of things. Number 50, so we know how to build a character, and we know they have many solutions to every problem. So what do those solutions look like? Well, the most classic ones involve the use of weapons. You can choose from one or two-handed melee options or the wide variety of guns on display. Number 51. These weapons come from different corporations in Halcyon, each with their own characteristics. Spacer's Choice, for example, makes weapons that break easily, but they're cheap to buy and fix. If that's a trade-off you're willing to live with, we won't stop you. Number 52. You can easily switch between your equipped weapons in the heat of combat. It's all thanks to the classic weapon wheel. Number 53. Of course, this wouldn't be an RPG without some unique legendary weapons. In the Outer Worlds, they're called science weapons, and they do some wild stuff. They're designed to reward characters who are more intelligent than they are deadly. They make up for brute strength with, well, absolute chaos. Number 54. You can expect to find five of them at launch. One for each weapon category. Light melee, heavy melee, handgun, long gun, and heavy gun. You'll need to explore the world and do some side quests to find them. Number 55. The shrink ray is a perfect example, and it does exactly what you'd expect. As long as you're pointing it at an enemy, they'll shrink and be more vulnerable to damage. Instead of you getting stronger, the gun makes your enemy weaker. Now that's thinking outside the box. Number 56. The light melee science weapon actually came from a bug Obsidian found. The mandibular rearranger slows down enemies with every hit and rearranges their faces. We weren't kidding when we said the developers were going for the absurd. Number 57. Science weapons, much like all the other ones, can be tinkered with to increase their level, making them deadlier. Additionally, science weapons scale with your science skill, becoming more effective the smarter your character is. Don't sleep on that STEM field, kids. Number 58. Most normal weapons can also be modded and repaired at workbenches. Want a scope on that rifle? Done. Want a better grip for your melee weapon? No problem. Want to switch out the lead bullets for plasma? That eh, makes sense, so why not? Number 59. In combat, you can use an ability called the Vault Tech Assisted Target. I mean, the tactical time dilation. When activated, time slows down, and you can target specific enemy body parts. This totally not VATS mechanic relies on a meter that depletes as you use it, so you can't rely on it too often. Number 60. Like the name implies, TTD has a lot of tactical uses. If you hit an enemy's legs, they'll run slower. If you hit their arms, they'll drop their weapon. Little things like that give combat a bit more depth than just shooting something until it stops moving. Number 61. You can thank your 70 years of cryo sleep for the ability to bend time on a whim. So maybe arriving in Halcyon way later than you planned to wasn't all that bad. Number 62. For players who like combat and want to use TTD all the time, there's a whole suite of perks to help you keep it activated for longer and more often. There's even a tier 3 perk that lets you move at full speed for a few seconds while everything else slows down you basically become a superhero. Number 63. But what if you don't want to attract too much attention to yourself, let alone fight? Well, hacking computers, picking locks, and silent footwork all play a role in the outer worlds. Number 64. If you need a little boost to your stealth prowess, companions can also lend a hand. If you have a sneaky friend in your party, you'll benefit from their skill and become more stealthy yourself. This bonus branches out to other skills besides sneaking too, so picking the right companions for the right job is pretty important. You need to know what they do best. Number 65. One of those sneaky companions you'll meet is Nyoka. She's a big game hunter, so stealth is in her wheelhouse. Just keep in mind, she also likes her booze, so maybe don't take her on delicate sneaking missions after she's had a few drinks. Number 66. Every companion gets a special attack they can use in combat. In Nyoka's case, it involves unleashing a terrifying war cry and hundreds of bullets. Number 67. Sure, Sure, your companions will fight by your side through Halcyon, but they're not just mindless killing machines. They'll often voice their opinions or concerns during dialogue. They'll also react to most of your decisions, playing off your actions. Number 68. In total, there are six companions that have been confirmed for the game, including Nyoka. When you're out in the field though, you can only have two with you at a time, and the rest stay in the ship. Just don't forget to crack the window open for them. Number 69. While there may be six companions, not one of them is a furry little friend. That's right, there are no dogs in Outer Worlds. That's one thing I'm gonna miss from Fallout. 
Number 70. Ellie is a mercenary who can join your company. She's definitely done some shady stuff in the past, so she won't judge you that harshly if you do some shady stuff yourself. Overall, she doesn't take crap, and she definitely looks out for herself before anyone or anything else. Number 71. Parvati is the exact opposite, because she likes to help people. She might have a naive outlook on life, but she's also a mechanic who gives her inventions personalities. So, she gets a pass from me. Number 72. For as kind as she is, she's no pushover. Her special attack lays the smack down on enemies with an electrified hand. It's like having Thor in your party. Number 73. We've also got Felix to deal with here, and deal with is definitely the right way to phrase it. He's your classic rebel without a cause, and he hates authority, man. Number 74. He hates it so much that he'll dropkick it in the face. Seriously, that's his special attack in combat. He'll just run up to something and dropkick it. Number 75. Vicar Max is another companion you can pick up during your travels. When he's in your party, he gives you a bonus to your hacking and intimidate skills. Number 76. Sam, the robot companion, also grants a bonus to your hacking and intimidate stats. While you can't give Sam any equipment, he uses an acid spray against foes. Number 77. Clearly, there are a lot of friends to recruit, and you can find them pretty early. You'll meet every possible companion within the first third of the game, so you know they'll be there for most of your adventure. After all, when's the last time you've cared about a party member who jumped in at the last minute? Number 78. Of course, you don't need to recruit anyone if you don't want to. You can remain a lone wolf as you journey through Halcyon. Sure, that's two less friends that can protect you, but that's also two less mouths to feed. Different strokes, right? Number 79. Okay, so I don't know if you literally need to feed them, even on supernova mode, but if you do play on supernova difficulty, companions can permanently die. Sometimes, avoiding the pain of loss is better than getting attached to someone you could lose forever. Oh. Number 80. As you grow, your companions will grow with and react to you. Your friendship will culminate in companion quests, which can change the way your allies treat you. Alternatively, if you become a murderous psychopath, some of them will just bail on you, even when you need their help. Number 81. And yes, you can be a murderer psychopath, and you can kill everyone in the game. Really. Everyone. It probably won't be easy, but you can make it happen. It's not like in Skyrim where important quest characters will just take a knee for a minute. Even if you're the only person left in Halcyon, you can still finish the story on your own. Number 82. Killing everyone sounds simple, but it must have been tough for Obsidian to give players that freedom of choice. For every important NPC, they needed to come up with a backup plan to help players finish whatever quest that NPC is tied to. Maybe there's a note you can loot from their corpse, or a nearby terminal has the information you need. There needs to be a contingency for every quest essential character in the Outer Worlds. Number 83. In theory, you could also beat the game without killing anything. At least, almost anything. Some story-specific encounters might back you into a corner, but you could always let your companions pull the trigger if you want your character to be a pure pacifist. Number 84. Sometimes, you can use your social skills to avoid combat at all, and the various settlements on Halcyon provide lots of opportunities for conversation to blossom. Everywhere you turn, someone wants to give you a quest or tell you a story. More often than not, these people will be a little off-kilter, just enough to make things fun. Number 85. These conversations get really fun when you start sprinkling in a few white lies. I can turn a little fetch quest into a robbery simply by telling the quest giver that, eh, hey, I couldn't find the prized possession. But between you and me, I totally did. And now it's mine. I'd never condone telling lies, of course, but in the cutthroat world of Halcyon, eh, bending the truth might come in handy. Number 86. The lies keep getting better when you don disguises to get into restricted spaces. They're not quite what you'd expect, though. You don't slip into some new clothes or anything. Instead, you project a hologram over yourself, and it runs out of juice as you walk around. Number 87. If you're spotted while your disguise is almost gone, you'll have to trick whoever catches you with your silver tongue. If you're successful, you can roam around freely again. However, after getting caught three times, your luck runs out, and you've got to fight to survive. Number 88. We've mentioned some corporations already, like Spacer's Choice and Aunt Cleo's. Your actions affect your reputation with them, and determine how much they'll like or hate you. For example, if word gets around that you've killed a bunch of people from Spacer's Choice, other representatives of the corporation might just attack you on sight. Number 89. But what if you're sneaky about it? Well, you'll still leave bodies behind, and factions will send out a representative to investigate if they're found. They might ask you if you know anything about it, and depending on your reactions, you could smooth things over or antagonize them further. Number 90. In fact, you can become an enemy of society in general. If you keep committing crimes, like breaking and entering, stealing, or, you know, murder, people might notice, especially if you do it in public. Number 91. For an out-of-the-way space colony, there's actually a well-established society in Halcyon. In the early days of colonization, the corporations found two habitable celestial bodies, which is where you'll spend most of your time. Number 92. Terra 2 is a corporate paradise. 
Generally, people on that planet follow the whims of their corporate overlords, and the city of Byzantium stands as a gated community for well-to-do rich folk who played and won the game called Capitalism. Number 93. But not everything on Terra 2 is so peachy. The entire town of Edgewater is owned by Spacer's Choice, and everyone in town works at the Saltuna canning facility. When a worker dies, they're buried at Spacer's Choice Cemetery but only after they pay fees to the company. Number 94. Other than that, outlaws live beyond the settlements, often in protest of the overreaching power of the companies. Even out there, people aren't happy under their leadership. Number 95. Okay, so if there's Terra 2, where's Terra 1? Well, that's the nearby moon known today as Monarch. The board tried to terraform it a while back, but they ultimately failed. Now, it stands as a testament of their failure. Number 96. Life on Monarch is tough. The native wildlife on the planet ended up getting mutated, and it's hard to live a peaceful life when everything wants to eat you, right? Number 97. But the human spirit is resilient, if anything. People still found a way to live on Monarch, and most of them despise the board. Its influence has been dwindling in the face of rebellion. Number 98. Compared to Terra 2, Monarch will feel more like an open world space. You'll find a handful of towns to visit, along with vast wastelands to explore. Number 99. However, it's worth noting that the Outer Worlds will not be an open world game. These various spaces will be huge, and there will be a lot of quests to complete and things to find. For the most part though, you'll be traveling between these big open spaces. Number 100. Terra 2 and Monarch are the two major hubs for players to explore, but you'll find other smaller locations too, like the Groundbreaker. This gigantic ship is the one that made it to Halcyon on time, unlike the one you were cryogenically frozen on. It now acts as a trading port on Terra 2. Number 101. There's also an asteroid called Scylla, which is now full of abandoned laboratories, and absolutely no people. That's not spooky at all. Number 102. You'll also visit a planet called Tartarus, and to say it has harsh living conditions would be an understatement. Kane describes it as a worse Venus, which sounds uncomfortably hot. Tartarus is a prison colony controlled by Spacer's Choice, where the worst of the worst are sent. Hmm, why would a company need their own prison? Makes you wonder. Number 103. With all the comparisons to New Vegas, it only makes sense for the Outer Worlds to have mod support, right? Well, it's not happening at launch, unfortunately, but the developers want to make it happen. They plan on poking around after it ships to see what they can do. Number 104. The game will absolutely not have microtransactions, which is great news for my wallet. Though, Boyarsky has said they'd love if there were DLC planets in the future. Number 105. Microsoft bought Obsidian back in November 2018, but you don't have to worry about the Outer Worlds being a Microsoft exclusive. Private Division is publishing the game, so it's available for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC on launch. It's coming to the Nintendo Switch, too, but we're gonna have to wait a bit longer for that version. The Outer Worlds on the go? Hey, good things come to those who wait, right? Number 106. For everyone else, The Outer Worlds has been out since October 25th, 2019. So what are you waiting for? Go play it! Number 107. Just a quick warning though, if you're getting it on PC, you'll have to go through the Epic Game Store or the Microsoft Store. If you're looking to pick it up on Steam, you'll have to wait until next year. That's 107 facts right off the bat, but you know there's tons more to explore in the Outer Worlds itself. Are you playing the game? What kind of character are you running? Let us know your favorite moment so far. I've been Marcus with the leaderboard. We're 1 million players and counting, so why not subscribe?